Hello and welcome to the Bestseller Experiment, where we continue to discover what makes a bestseller and inspire you to start, finish and publish your book. I'm Mark DeVoe. And I am Mark Stay. And this episode is sponsored by our wonderful patrons and academics at the Bestseller Academy, without whom we simply could not keep this show going. So if you want to support the podcast, pop over to Patreon or look at look at the Academy. This will be opening the doors at some point in the future. And it's an amazing thing. Mr. D, how are you today? I'm doing great. I'm doing absolutely brilliant, Mr. Stay. It's uh it's it's crazy. It's like a minute ago it was Easter. It feels like the week before it was Christmas. I mean, before we know it, the summer will be over and done with and we'll be out of this COVID malarkey, which would be nice. Or is that wishful thinking? We had, we had snow yesterday. We I had heard. Snow yesterday. Yeah, like okay, minus was, temperatures in the yeah, UK. It's, bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. And how's everything in your world, despite the chilliness? How's everything? It's good. It's good. I've started uh, this week, this very week, on the uh, the third Witches of Woodville book, uh, Skyclad, which is the working title at the moment. Um, and yeah, I'm off to a, a rollicking start. And it's been really, really good fun because I'm, I'm adapting the method I used on the previous one, which was, you know, using a notebook and then hammering at the keys. And on this one, it's, it's, it's kind of a more refined version of that. So I, I know what my ending is. But I'm to, and I've got some, you know, key points that I know I want to hit. There are things I want to do, but I'm just writing and then going, eh, what happens next? And then I come away from the screen and then I write it freehand with this, this pen here, this very pen in that notebook there and kind of doodle about. So I will have a day. Today was a notebook day. Everything went in the notebook. And then tomorrow I'll essentially take what's in the notebook and bring it to life. I'll I put it on that. the screen. I love that. It's almost like, it's almost like doing a, a first scribble as opposed mm. to a first draft. But by the time you actually put it onto the screen, it already has a sense of um, marinating overnight in the fridge. Exactly. The marinating is the important bit because once you've got it on paper, it's there ticking away. And, you know, when I'm doing, you know, filling the dishwasher or whatever, it's, oh, you know, I'll remember something and send myself a message. And it is, it takes away the tyranny of that winking cursor on the screen, you know, and your Scrivener file or Word file or whatever. Whereas I'm just, I, I'll, I'll just open the notebook and you just start going, okay. Oh, it will sometimes literally start with me going, okay, what can this chapter be about? I, w I will actually just write that and then answer the question and then and then ask myself questions. And then from that, that kind of conversation, it's, it's chapters will, will, will come along. And um, it's been really, that said, you know, I'm not even 10,000 words into the thing yet. It might go become horribly derailed in the next couple <laughs> of weeks, but it sort of worked on the last one. And, it's the third in a series. I, I get why people write series because, uh, you know, the the main characters, I know who they are. They're all done. Uh, I know. They're all done. Well, yeah. I mean, it's not that they're done, but I no, know but how they react. Know. Well, because that's the thing. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge amount. It's like, it's like a startup cost. Everyone knows if you yeah, start yeah, a yeah. business, right, there's a huge amount of thinking you've got to do up front. There's a lot of effort you've got to plow in before you even get any benefit. But the fact that you are continuing the story means you can focus on the story more than focusing on having to really learn and develop about you know who i mean i know the characters develop all the time but you've done such an amount of work on development you don't have to start with that with the new book and i think that's a secret isn't it that we never really kind of cottoned onto a series the groundwork is done the groundwork is is kind of there and you build up from that and that that makes such a difference and you can have, and it means you can have a bit more fun with it antagonist as well because you kind of think well who's the worst person i can torment them with this time <laughs> and that's that that just makes it fun so um yeah uh first week all good ask me again in a few weeks and see <laughs> well, we, exactly see if we'll, i'm still we'll feeling in a month where you're there with your ha <laughs> had it hand in your your ha head in your hands and just kind of yeah. like oh my god but I, I, we do have to we do have to claim this i think mark we do have to claim this we're going to trademark the marinade process we want everyone to start <laughs> using that word and tell us if it works for you. I think this is a really great experiment to try. It's like try a marinating process, do what Mark's done, and then report back to us. Say, oh, yeah, I've tried this for the first time and it really works. Or, um, you know, it's really helped you. Because I, I wonder if that reduces, if you think about the actual duration, the journey of the novel, by doing the marinating, you know, do you get a tastier book by the end of that process? Does it? I think you get a better first draft. 
Um, right. I certainly feel like by the time I get to the end of this first draft, each chapter, I mean, it, just looking back at the chapters I've already done, I'm thinking, yeah, they're in pretty good shape. And the things, as I'm going along, I'm thinking, ah, I need to put a little bit of that in. So I don't go back and rewrite. I just leave a note and say, add a bit of this when you come back to this. So when I come to the rewrites, I've already got things to do. And that's part of the, that's half the battle when you come to your first rewrite of your, you know, your, um, your, your dirty laundry vomit draft or whatever. You, you you come to it and you've got a little shopping list of things that just get you working. And once you're working, once your fingers are tapping, that's half the battle. You know, it's just getting that momentum going again. So, um, yeah, it's, it's working so far. It's exciting stuff. And one other thing, Mark, we were talking, we've been talking about like backdrops that people are using in, in Zoom calls and all these kind of funky things. Now, you have a new friend that's appeared, I've noticed for the first time on uh, just to the side of you. And I can't work out if you've, if you've dropped that in as some kind of clever image, because your normal backdrop is, is your actual, you know, your studio where you write. Uh, tell us about, tell us about this uh, cardboard cutout that you've got there. Well, I just thought I'd put Boba Fett there, just because there's um there's a sort of a, a gap in the um you know I it's it's yeah and he's he's there, there folded up he's like a six foot four cardboard standee of Boba Fett that my friend Tim got me for Christmas a few years ago. Well, this was the, I was and, curious about the story behind it. <laughs> well, yeah, it was a Christmas present, and it's one of those things. If we ever have people to stay over the night. I'll unfold him and just leave him standing in the corner of a corridor. So if they get up for the loo in the middle of the night, <laughs> I can hear their screams from upstairs, uh, which brings me great joy. Oh, that's brilliant. I was half <laughs> expecting a, yes, well, it was uh, the Odeon in Guildford and uh, we, I had cover. <laughs> I went out the door. We had the taxi waiting, stuck it on what's, the roof. What's interesting is um, when um, Robot Overlords was released, uh, in the Far East, at least, it's Singapore. We were number one in Singapore, you know. I mean, it got Brilliant. a massive, and they had these huge, huge cardboard standees, and people were sending me photos of them standing next to them. I was thinking, I mean, I've got nowhere to put it, but there's a part of me thinking, oh, I wish I had one of those, you know. <laughs> I want a giant, just you know, when you have people around, I'm just going to casually wheel this into the room, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, no. So I then they all get. Because I used to work in a video shop and you get these standees all the time and the posters and I used to do the window displays. This is my, one of my favourite parts of the job is doing the window displays, finding new ways to fan out 32 posters of Sister Act. You know, <laughs> that's how long ago it was. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I, I, know, I'm, I'm fond of cardboard. That's that's amazing. <laughs> this is, again, we learn something new every time we do a show together. We both worked at video stores as teenagers. What age were you when you worked at a video store? I was probably 19, 19. 20. It was Moonlight Movies in Craddock's Parade, Ashton, which was still there just a couple of years ago. It closed <sighs> just before the DVD release of Robot Overlords. I was hoping to go back there and go... <coughs> <clears throat> have you got robot overlords to rent? And they go, no, <laughs> but they were closed. Uh, but yeah, oh. I, I used to, I used to work there and I, I loved it. I really, really oh. loved it. You could only watch PG movies. So I watched all the Star Trek movies back to back. I watched Hunt for Red October, which is a PG, uh, Home Alone more times than anyone ever probably should. But um, yeah, I used to just sit and watch movies all day. And that has an effect on a young I man can when he's- see you know, yeah. how that played out, Mr. Stay. <laughs> well, it's, it's fascinating. I, I've got so many stories. We'll have to drill so them out over you? the next So where were you? Where were you? I was, in, I was in the video store in Fetchum, Hazel Parade, and it was only open for two years. Possibly because I worked there. I don't know if it was my <laughs> fault. But I literally was kind of given the guy had a news agent, so he decided he's a bit of an entrepreneur and he decided he was going to open up, but the hairdressers went went bankrupt and he took over that shop next door, set up a video store. And I just all I all I can remember from it is the smell of um sausages that were cooking in one of those <laughs> machines. Like trying to recreate that kind of foyer cinema aroma. And I also <laughs> remember um a little a little kind of flap in the floor of the behind where I stood because I was I, I I ran the shop like the guy. I Is was that where you put the money? Put the money when you got yeah, notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was fourteen years old, 14. and I was <laughs> I know, and I was given command of this shop. And there were times when people would come in. I always I'll never forget the one couple that would come in. They looked a bit sheepish, 
And uh, and then they started looking and they were like, I think two, this is VHS, right? Two soft porn movies mm, on the top shelf. Yeah. And I was like, please don't, please don't. Like, no one had ever taken them out. And I was like, please don't take, no, this is going to be so embarrassing. Can you imagine that as 14? Well, I, I, tell you, I tell you one day we had this guy, because you could only take out like three at a time. So he came in and he rented three softcore porn movies, left the store. A couple of hours later, came back, brought them back, <laughs> rented three more. Okay, a couple of hours, came back, brought them back, rented three more. And he must have known I was giving him a funny look by now. And he said, he said, he said, don't, he said, look, he said, my boss is entertaining some Arabs. And he said, they can't get this stuff where they are. So this is all they want to watch. So <laughs> these Arab businessmen had come all the way to Ashton. <laughs> To watch Sorry. softcore pornography. <laughs> <laughs> now, he's either making that up or that's the best excuse ever. So, yeah. <laughs> you have a long trench coat. Oh, my gosh. I tell you what, that's brilliant. I, 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 oh, my goodness. Okay, that'll be, we'll have to do a theme of stories from the video stores of all the old childhood because there's many more of those. That's absolutely brilliant. Oh, my gosh. I've got to get my breath back. Anyway. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> Where were we? No, I don't I have no idea. I think we were doing a podcast about writing at some yes. point. Yes, fans, fans. <laughs> Fans of our special guests this week will be going, have I, have I got, is this the right yes, podcast? The, is this the, 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 the video experiment podcast? Oh my goodness me. Oh goodness me. It is fun to, to, to go back and our oh, youth. It, it, you have to laugh. And there have been yes. very few times yeah. when we've completely lost it on the show, but I think that will go down. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, yeah. folks, if Big you've ever worked in a video four, store, five and six. <laughs> if you've ever worked in a video store, please send us your stories. We're going to have a new feature every week just before the interview. Oh, you see, that's you see, you know what, Mark? You know, really, when you stand back and look at what happened, what's happening in the world, Netflix is brilliant, right? But like, what have we lost in the world without having video exactly. stores, right? Exactly. Right? We used to go to the libraries and take out tapes, you know, music. And yeah, be, uh, brilliant. So we have to keep we have to keep the nostalgia alive, and I'm sure everyone's probably got stories of video stores on the other side of the counter as well. But uh, <laughs> anyway, let's let's focus in. Um, let's talk about today's guest because yes, this is a cracker, absolute brilliant. Tell us about our, our wonderful guest today, Mark. Big change of gear. Let's let's talk from <laughs> from the ridiculous to the sublime, the sublime Adele Geras. Adele is one of Britain's most acclaimed writers and has written over 100 books for both children and adults. But with her latest novel, Dangerous Women, she's written her first historical thriller under a pseudonym. She's written it under the name Hope Adams, and she talks about why she chose that name in the interview. Uh, we talk about writing under a pseudonym, taking liberties with history, the challenges of writing a thriller for the first time, the benefits of editors, and why she still wants to be Judy Garland. Brilliant. Let's have a listen in to Mark chatting with the, the loveliest Adele Geras. Adele Geras, welcome to the bestseller experiment. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. I had my injection yesterday for my vaccine, so I'm feeling very perky. Fantastic. Excellent news. Oh, well, that's wonderful. We're, we're well on our way then. Uh, I should get my, the current rate, I should get mine sometime in September or October, but, you know, fingers crossed. <laughs> You're young. You have the advantage of being young. That's true. That's true. Um, well, let's talk about your new book, Dangerous Women, which comes with a new author name. You're writing as Hope Adams. And this is an extraordinary story of almost 200 female prisoners who, in 1841, they're transported to, to Van Diemen's Land, which is now known as Tasmania. And when one of them is mortally wounded, the hunt is on for the murderer. And I'm told it was inspired by a quilt that you saw at the VNA. Can, can you tell us about that? Yes, it is the most amazing story. Um, I went to an exhibition called Quilts in 2009, and there it was hanging on the wall. It had been lent by the Museum of Australia, National Museum in Canberra. And it's very beautiful. And I looked at it and thought, this is very beautiful. And then I read the story of its making, which is, as you say, 180 women convicts transported from London to Van Diemen's land. And this time, on this particular voyage, they had with them a young woman called Kezia Hayter, who was only 23. She was the cousin, the niece, 
of George Hayter, the a court painter at Queen Victoria's court. And she was sent specifically to sort of oversee the welfare of the women. She was part of, you know, a lot of prison reform that was going on uh, around about then under Elizabeth Fry and people like that. So she was sent to help them. And I was reading all about this and thinking, that's marvellous, that's fantastic. And then at the end, it said, by the end of the voyage, Kezia Hayter was engaged to be married to the captain. And I thought, no, <laughs> you've got to be kidding me. If I had presented that as a fictional story, my editor would have quite rightly said, oh, don't be ridiculous. That is just <laughs> such a sloppy romantic ending. We can't possibly, no one would believe it, but it happened. And so I was, my interest was completely uh, engaged then. And really, since then, I, I've I've had a lot of other books, obviously, in between 2009 and now. But uh, eventually I wrote it. And I have to say, I have taken huge liberties uh, with the plot because the actual voyage of the Raja, which is incredibly well documented. You know, we have the captain's log. We have the surgeon's log. We have Kezia's diaries we have a list of every single convict with their crime and their vital statistics down to the colour of their eyes, everything. It was a very peaceful and uneventful voyage, really. Uh, there was one natural death towards the end. There wasn't that much illness. It was, it was fine, but that wouldn't do for a novel. So I have injected a thriller plot just to, to keep, you know, to keep things interesting and to keep the kind of momentum going while I hope you know not in any way distorting uh, the historical facts yeah well let, let's talk about that because I think I mean you've written nearly a hundred books from what more I can than, gather more than more than, well, more than okay excellent more than a hundred books <laughs> <laughs> who's counting who's counting um and is this is this sort of murder mystery thriller element, is this the first for you? Yes, yes, it absolutely is a first. And in fact, it was thanks to my lovely agent, I have to say, who when I presented her with the first sort of, I don't know, 50 pages or so, immediately pointed at a character and said, oh, well, she's got to die. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> And I could see that immediately if she did die, uh, things would perk up um, and, and be a lot more interesting for the reader. But yes, it, it is definitely my first uh, in any way thriller. Yeah. What were the what were the challenges, the new challenges? Because thrillers and mysteries, for me, that is storytelling. It's plotting with with the hood up. You know, you can see all the work. people are looking for plot holes with with mysteries because they're 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 following every clue and and thread and mystery. What what were the big challenges for you? Absolutely. Well, the challenge the challenge for me was, it's a kind of locked room mystery because they are all on this ship. So there was that, and it did take quite a lot of uh, tinkering about. I think this is helped by the fact that I'm one of the people who does very careful planning beforehand. Uh, I, I don't quite, I've never quite understood the people who say, oh, I just sit down and write. And I think the people who do that, who write the whole, you know, the whole thing out first, and then go back and rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it. I think they're doing a version of what I do before I start, which is work out very clearly where everything goes and when everything happens and, and plan everything out very carefully. Not to say that things can't go wrong after that and have to be adjusted. And of course, once you have two editors, one in America, one in the USA, with their minds bent on how to present things so that they have the most impact, then you've got a lot of help along the way to, to make things kind of stand out really well. And that, that's that's fantastically useful. I'm a great believer in good editors. Absolutely. Absolutely. They help you all the way, don't they? They're, uh, a good one really, really does. Yeah. So you're also writing 
with a, a pseudonym, Hope Adams. Why, why, why the switch to a pseudonym this time? Uh, two reasons. I was looking for a new agent, and I didn't want to try and find one under my own name because I didn't want anyone to have any preconceptions. I didn't want them to be able to go and look back into the mists of time because I'm that <laughs> old um, to see, you know, how well I'd sold or all the rest of it. So I wanted to be absolutely unknown. So I called myself Hope because I was hoping. <laughs> and I called myself Adams for the, for the most base of reasons, really. I wanted to be up in the, at the beginning of the alphabet. <laughs> and I wanted to have a name that nobody would say, how do you pronounce that? What's the origin of that? And I'd have to explain to them all about Geras and that it's not Geras or Gerard or anything else. Um, and so that was what, and, and it also... This this might be just me, but it looks it looks very good on a book jacket. The words are kind of almost the same size. They're short. No one can mispronounce them. It's a terrific name. I really like it. What I particularly love about this is there are uh, reviews on Goodreads and the like saying um, this is a remarkable debut novel. <laughs> Debut for hope. It's a debut for hope uh, in America, where I am not as much published. Uh, certainly not for adults. I mean, my my teenage books have done well in the USA, but um, I'm not at all known uh, as an adult writer in America. There, they are just saying, you know, a debut. Uh, but of course, the the what do you call it, websites and the Twitter handles and all of that is still a Delguera. So, you know, it's not going to take them long to figure it out. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about your extraordinary career. Over 100 books published. You've corrected me on that. I, I'm glad to be as well. Um, but I hear, I hear that when you were starting out, you didn't want to be a writer. You wanted to be Judy Garland. Absolutely. I still do. I still do. If you're offering still hope. <laughs> I would be up in a, in a heartbeat to be singing on stage somewhere. Absolutely. I was going to be a star. I was actually, I was doing quite well at being a star, really. I was, I was in a lot of uh, shows that went to the Edinburgh Festival and to the West End and so on when I was a student. And then at the end of my university career, 1966, this is, um, we were in a show called Four Degrees Over, which went to the West End, me and three lads. And it closed very quickly uh, by Christmas that year. Uh, the show was closed and I married in 1967 and went up to live in Manchester where there was no demand for stars at all. So I became a teacher. <laughs> which is what stars do when they can't get a job because you've got an audience, you know. Um, and then I, I went in for a writing competition in The Times and it was for a, a children's story. And I'm ashamed and afraid to say that everybody, I mean, absolutely everybody, and me included at that time, everybody thinks, ah, oh, a children's story, that's got to be easy. Actually, it's much harder. It's much yeah. harder than anything. But that's another podcast. Um, so I went in for this competition and I didn't win. But what it taught me was how much I really enjoyed just writing the story because I was my own boss. You know, I could do whatever I wanted and I could do it lying down on the sofa. It was marvellous. It was a lot easier than teaching. And so I started, you know, sending out picture book texts and stuff like that, which for about two years, nobody, you know, took the least notice of. And then I, then I wrote my first book, which was called Tea at Mrs. Manderby's, uh, which was one of those, I don't know if they still have them now, um, about 2,000 words long. Um, and uh, I suppose you'd call them an early reader. Um, mm, the yes. children, who, yeah. children who are just learning to read. And they were published by Hamish Hamilton. And they were brilliant because what, what they did, very clever trick, very clever publishing move, they did up these 2,000-word stories as if they were grown-up hardbacks. So they were hardbacked with a paper dust jacket 
and illustrations, you know, throughout, black and white illustrations throughout. And every little child who read them was reading basically a replica of what her parents were reading, you know, the proper mm -hmm. hardback book. And they were marvellous. Um, and so I started there. And from then it just sort of went, you know, on and on. Did you find that having a background in theatre helped you? We had Sally Gardner on the podcast quite recently, and she worked in set design and production design and costume. But she said just watching those plays, watching stories unfold on stage really, really helped her. And as an actor, have you found that's been useful over the years? Definitely. I mean, in the days when I used to go around schools, I used to tell the kids that writing is really like putting on a different set of clothes. You know, today you're an elderly ballerina and tomorrow you're a vampire and, you, you know, you can be a pirate. You can be whoever you want. So, yes, it is very much an acting job. And I do see, I mean, I believe Enid Blyton had this, but I do actually see my scenes as though Martin Scorsese was directing them or somebody. <laughs> any any director can apply. Um <laughs> as though they're being directed, you know, in front of my eyes. I can actually see how they look, how people are behaving uh, as I write. Yeah. Mm. That's funny. Sally, Sally said exactly the same thing. She she visualises these things very, very clearly. You made the switch. For, well, there was an overlap. You continued writing children's stories, but you started writing adult fiction. What were the big changes you noticed uh, from moving from, from one? Okay. <laughs> That was a massive change. Actually, it came, it came, to be fair, it came slightly before I started writing adult fiction. It came in about 1999 when I wrote a teenage book called Troy for David Fickling, who said at the time that the received wisdom was that teenage books were about, I don't know, 80,000 words, something like that, maximum. And then Philip Pullman wrote his first Dark Materials book and David published it. And he, David was so sort of excited by all of this. He said to me when I was writing Troy, he said, oh, make it any length, any length you like. So I, you know, off I went. So I did have two or three quite fat teenage books before I wrote Facing the Light. Um, but yes, the length is the main thing. Otherwise, as I say, it's an acting job. You know, one day you're six years old and the next day you're 85 years old. That's fine. You know, you just <laughs> pretend to be that person. Uh, so I didn't find it that much of except that Facing the Light, which was my first book for Orion, was sold on, I think, 87 pages of text and a synopsis of the rest. So that was the point at which I had to sit down and write a synopsis of the rest. And that led me into my very close planning mode. Excellent. Excellent. Before, well, that, before that, my plans were sort of a page of a page of A4, you know, roughly what's going to happen. But it was that experience uh, that made <laughs> that made me do it. We used to have very funny conversations with my husband after I'd signed the contract, as I say, on about 80 pages of text. And we'd lie in bed and my husband would say, what if you can't write the rest? And I'd say, shut up and go to sleep. Um, of course you can write the rest, you know, you, you, you have to. But having a plan, you know, did make it. Very, very much safer and easier. Yeah. When, because uh, that's that, for, for a lot of authors starting out for the first time, you usually have to deliver the whole thing up front, and then an editor works with it. But when you're when you're delivering what's known as a partial, when you deliver those those first few chapters, the editor will give you feedback. And and you said, you know, with um, with uh, your new book as well, Dangerous Women, the editor looked at it and said, "Oh, it's a murder mystery now." That kind of interaction with an editor, do you find that easy to do? You, do you encourage that? Do you? Yes, uh, I I am very good at being taught. I was a very good schoolgirl. I listen to my teachers. If somebody says, "Look, I can help you make this even better," I'm up for that. There are people who won't have a dot or comma changed in their text. I'm not one of them. I'm very happy 
to take everybody else's ideas on board, although I do reserve the right to say no sometimes. But basically, I can I can see, you can always tell, you can always tell. If, if an editor says, do this, and you just recoil like a snail having salt thrown all over it, then you know they're wrong. There are many, many occasions, though, where an editor says, why don't you try and do this? And you think, oh, why didn't I think of that? Of course, it's brilliant. I'll give you a concrete example. When I wrote Troy, I had the very good idea of having the gods sort of interacting with the, with the mortals. And I wrote it as a kind of straight story. And then every now and then I would have a god, as it were, coming to the front of the stage and declaiming. And when David Fickling accepted it, he said, yes, yes, marvellous, it's going to be great, it's terrific. He says, but had you thought, he said, had you thought about having the gods as characters in the action, just interweaving with, the, and I thought, oh my God, no, 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 I've got to rewrite the whole thing. He said, just try it. He yeah. says, just try it and see if it works. And I tried it and it worked absolutely brilliantly. And it's the one thing, you know, that everybody picks out, you know, how marvellous it is that the gods are characters in the action. So, yeah, sometimes people just have brilliant ideas and you have to be ready to run with them. It's a gift, isn't it? It is a gift. It's yeah. So oh, yeah. A gift. yeah, yeah, it is. Wonderful stuff. We're obsessed with writing routines and habits of authors on this podcast. Has your habit evolved over time? What's your what's your writing habit now? Well, it used to be much more strict uh, than it than it is now because I used to be in charge of small children. When you're in charge of small children, your time is very limited, and I was writing in sort of three hour bouts in cafes before J.K. Rowling had gone to school, even <laughs> because that was the time when Sophie was in her playgroup. I had between nine and 12, and that was the hours. Those were the hours, and that was when I wrote. Later on, you'd do it in the evening, because, again, you know, you're busy in the day looking after kids. As you get older, as I've got older, and I've got more time, I've kind of become much lazier. <laughs> uh, I, I have brilliant, I'm very, very good at delaying tactics. So <laughs> By rights, by rights, I should get up, sit down, have breakfast, sit down, work for three hours. I never work for more than three hours. Uh, work for three hours and then clock off and have the rest of the lovely day off. But I never do that. I get up, I have breakfast, I read the paper, I do emails, I go for a walk now in lockdown. And round about sort of three o'clock or so, if I'm writing, I think, crikey, you know, I better do something. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, you know, I'll have to stop to make supper and watch Netflix and goodness knows what else. So I generally now write in the afternoon, really, except when I'm absolutely in the thick of it or doing massive editing or something like that. Um, but it, it's, it helps that I'm very fast. Mm. Once I do sit down and start typing, then I am very fast. And that's why I never, hardly ever work more than two or three hours a day, um, which I reckon is quite enough. <laughs> quite, <laughs> two, three hours a day, quite enough for everybody. Um, and because I've, I think that the planning makes the writing speedier. I do sometimes take much longer if I'm struggling over a plan. That's, that's a very hard bit. But once I know where I'm going, hmm. then uh, I'm quite a speedy writer. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, you're clearly doing something right. Uh, so over over a hundred books it's a published. Bit, it's a bit sort of all these. Uh, I absolutely love. I'm going to go back and listen to all your podcasts. I absolutely <laughs> love hearing about how other people write. Hmm. And there's yeah. an element, I think, of the elves and the shoemaker about it. You know, you do your thing, and the books come out the other end. And if you examine it too closely and think, oh, you know, maybe I'm doing it wrong, maybe I should change it, you know, there's there's a chance you won't be able to do it. You just let your unconscious or whatever do its thing and, and you write. Uh, 
Very true. Very true. What I find really inspiring about Dangerous Women is after all this time, you've tried something new. You've tried taken on a new challenge. And, and from the reviews, it's, you know, it's clearly worked. What's next? What's the, because you've written in pretty much every genre, I think, with the exception of science fiction. So a, a, any chance we're going to see some UFOs and robots from you next to Dale? Absolutely not, because I oh, don't. Oh, go on, give it a go. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> this is the thing. You can only, you can only run. This is this is of two terribly unfair things. First of all, you can only write the books that you can write. You know, yes. I would love to write somebody else's books. I admire them so much, but I can't. It's like you know, wanting to be a six foot redhead. You you just can't. <laughs> um, you know, you're stuck with what you've got, and therefore, one of the things, if you're not going to go mad with boredom, you have got to write the kind of books you like to read. And I'm afraid I'm a science fiction free zone. <laughs> I've never even watched Doctor Who. I mean, I'm just, no, not for me at all. So I won't be writing. I'll be writing another, another, I hope to interject an element of mystery and I hope to link it to a real thing again. This, this is mm. what I'm saying. I'm, I, I, not something as dramatic as the Raja, but you know, something that exists and that people can see and can find the history of. So that's my next task. But I've got, because of, co of lockdown and COVID and all these things, my deadline has been beautifully extended. So I don't have to worry my pretty little head about it for the moment. So I'm having a lovely time not working. Uh, which is very nice. Well, I think I think you've earned a little bit of time off. Well, uh, folks, um, Dangerous Women by the wonderful debut novelist Hope Adams is out there now for you to enjoy wherever books are sold. Uh, Adele, thank you so much for speaking to us today and hope to speak to you again soon. Thanks a lot. Lovely. What are your writing dreams? Finishing that book, quitting the day job, becoming a best-selling author? Well, over four years, we've studied the advice of over 300 best-selling authors who've collectively sold over half a billion books. And we are excited to announce the Best Seller Academy. If you're ready to take your writing to the next level with accountability, craft, and coaching, your bestseller dreams are now only a click away. To find out more and apply, visit bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy that's bestsellerexperiment.com forward slash academy i i tell you what if, if there was if there was somebody that i could have a cup of tea and a yeah. bicky with an author she'd be in my top 10 Absolutely. She's absolutely lovely. And I, I I will get her to write a science fiction novel at some point. Uh, uh, it, it's going to happen. I won't, I won't let her uh, just blow it off like that. It's but it's, it's, she's, she's, she's terrific. She's absolutely terrific. And this thing of relaunching yourself under a new name, um, it's, it's interesting because I, I'm in a few writers' Facebook groups and there are a few which are, you know, published authors and very often traditionally published authors. And a lot of them get to a point in their career where they ask the question, has anyone done this? Has anyone written a completely different novel under a completely different name? How has it worked out for you? And it seems to be, it might just be me, but it seems to be happening a lot more. And I think one of the reasons for that is sim it's simply easier for a publisher to launch a new, air quotes, debut author, because you get the kind of coverage, you get you know, there's always there's always more of a story there, so it's, it's in, it'll be interesting to see if we see more and more of those. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And I, I also I love the fact when you asked Adele about you know how she came up with the name. I was expecting this like really kind of like like deep story about where where Hope Adams comes from, and it was almost like brilliant. It's like the yellow pages. It's like AAA one one plumbers. <laughs> <laughs> Get the front. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. I love that because, you know, it is important to think about. And, and I could tell from the way Adele was talking about, you know, even just how the, you know, there's a kind of a, a, a symmetry within the letters and it's a short word and you can't be mispronounced. I mean, hello, Mr. Mark Desvox, Defoe, Desfau, uh, and every other variation apart from Devoe. Um, I can really, and actually weirdly enough, it kind of brought me back to when we wrote our novel because I remember we had a big chat about, um, you know, whether we were going to do a pseudonym. In fact, for people who haven't heard the episode, you should go back, have a listen to the episode where we were discussing whether we were going to put the book out as a female pseudonym 
Do you remember that, Mark? Single. Yes. Going back a bit. <laughs> we had some interesting chats. But the reason that I decided to go with Mark Oliver um, on on the fiction side was obviously to, to distinguish between the non-fiction and the fiction, but, but it was also because Oliver is just an easier word to pronounce and... It's interesting. I, I um, I've been watching. There's a TV show, ten part TV series called The Terror, which is about the Franklin expedition that got stuck in the ice in the 1840s, and they all ended up eating each other. And it's a slight. They've embellished it with a slight supernatural element. Jared Harris, Kieran Hines, first class TV, absolutely brilliant TV. But and it's based on you know it's based on real people. And one of the there's a mutiny. That's not a big spoiler, but one of the mutineers is a Mister Devoe. And all really? through, yeah, all through the series, they're going, "Oh, I, I speak to Devoe, speak to," <laughs> I, 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 you know, I'm kind of what, what, hey, what? That's <laughs> yeah, so, so random. It's spelled slightly differently. Is it without but, the S? Uh, D-E-V. I can't recall. Yeah, yeah. But it, it's that's um, quite yeah. well. The weird thing is, is Devoe apparently. A little side note, but Devoe is apparently as popular as the surname Smith in Mauritius. And that's where my grandfather was born in Mauritius. Mm. So apparently there's a ton of Devos out there. Um, but uh, yeah, I've never actually met, I've never actually met someone with my surname before, apart from obviously my immediate family. But yeah, um, yeah so it's, it's fascinating. So that uh, one of the big takeaways for anyone thinking about doing a pseudonym is it's, it's not just about it's not just about how you pronounce the word, but we, in today's world of like gateway to authors is really kind of, you know, I mean, obviously it's Amazon, but it's also Google, but both have got search engines. And if people can't spell phonetically how you pronounce it, you're missing readers. You're going to miss readers if you've got some crazy long, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's phonetically challenging a surname. So that's, I mean, Hope Adams, like she said, you can't misspell that and you can't mishear it as well, which is which is another important thing. So brilliant idea. One of the other things that I loved as well was this this term that I'd never heard before, Mark, and you probably know about this, locked room. And I thought, because they're on a ship, but yes. it's this idea of everything being enclosed so that you nothing can happen outside that space. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Locked room mysteries, are, they're, they're a great subgenre of um of of crime and thrillers uh probably the first one Edgar Allan Poe did um uh murders in the rue morgue that's probably the first one uh but yeah i mean some so many Jonathan Creek do you remember the jo- tv show Jonathan yeah. Creek that was classic locked room because there'd be a body all the doors would be locked there there would be no sign of breaking in you know the and the the, the riddle has to be solved i mean agatha christie was a, was a genius genius at this as well so yeah the, the locked room mystery is a great great subgenre and um you can have terrific fun writing one of those and of course a ship at sea is the ultimate locked room mystery because where else could you go except <laughs> overboard overboard you know? right so um yeah, yeah it's yeah, wonderful it's survival so many, isn't yeah. it i yeah. think for me what what i love about that you know i've seen the two extremes you know you've got the kind of agatha christie's locked room idea where you've got these wonderfully defined boundaries that you get to play in so you can be as creative as you as you want but you have to you're in this like tight box so to speak so it really force it you know you don't have to worry about the kind of world building element to some extent and then you get the other extreme where people are world building to the nth degree you know infinite world building and they just spend all their time building their world and they never actually get to write the book and so I always remember Peter Gabriel talking about when he when he did a um, he did a great cover version of um, his ten favorite artist tracks, and in return, what they did is they recorded their favorite track of his, and they put out a double CD. Brilliant idea! But what he said in the linear notes was he said, you know, for the first time in my life, I realized that I loved the fact that I doing a cover. There's 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 defined boundaries, and I get to be as creative as I can within that space. But I've still got to I can't change the lyrics. You know, um, I'm, I'm, I've got a certain tempo I've got to stick to. And and he loved that fact because he doesn't like not having boundaries. He doesn't like being kind of infinite and running around and not knowing what, what to do. So the worst brief benefit. you can ever give to anyone creative, especially a writer, is, oh, write anything. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. No, give me, Build give me the some, world. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Put up some barriers. Just tell me, you know, give me some. And and that creates challenges and that gives you something to it and gives you focus. I think that's the most important thing. Focus. As well. And it also reduces the amount of decisions you have to make. And I think there's, there's something I've been studying recently called decision fatigue. And it's this idea when you've got so many things you have to decide in your story 
then you you know you, you, you have, you're worried people don't like making decisions because when you have to make a decision you've got to put your money on black or red and and that can be a little bit too too much of a, a commitment to some people so reducing the amount of decisions you have to make from the outset can be a very healthy way of being able just to focus in and write your book yeah it's interesting we've i mean we we talked about the suckage point you know when you get about a third of the way into your novel because that's when you have to start making serious story choices and decisions where the the kind of the wide appeal of it could be this it could be this it could be this is suddenly narrowed down and you can go that way or that way and that can terrify that can paralyze writers sometimes you know it's you're committing to a course you could always come back and rewrite. That's the thing. That's the thing you learn over time and experience. So it's one of the reasons I, I have the notebook method because I sit there going, right, what's next? And I will jot down a few different ideas. I could do this or I could do this. Oh, actually, let's do this instead. And by doing that freehand, I feel like I've not wasted my time. I've not wasted screen time. Mm -hmm. The difference between paper time and screen time, you know. <laughs> so um yeah. Wow. It's almost like we planned this. Isn't that amazing? It, it is kind of in, insane. And <laughs> and it wouldn't be a show, would it, Mr. Stay, without without talking about planning? Because we know that's one of our favourite things in the world. But Adele proves yet again. Bless her. Bless her. Right? Yeah. The little, she's little a little gold star on the planning front there. And, you know, I, I mean, she's, she's obviously written a, well, over 100 books. Um, I wonder, here's, a, here's an interesting thing. I wonder if you took all the authors that really plan heavily and all the authors who swear by pantsing, oh, just, I'm just going to write and just, and you look at the, the amount of books they write per year or on average over a lifetime even. I wonder if there is a difference there. I wonder if they write about the same amount of books. I wonder if the planners write more books. Now there's a question. That's interesting. I don't know if they, because the point that Adele made is essentially she's just doing a different version of pantsing. You, she, she's still making up as she goes along, but she's um, doing it before getting into the main, you know, getting her teeth into the main body of the novel. And what's interesting is she would do a few chapters and then send it to an editor, which is some, an advantage you have if you've got a close relationship with your publisher. Or if you're an indie author, you might have a developmental editor that you can liaise with or, or beta readers or other. Um, but I think that what she spoke about there is, is you know, great editors will give you those Oh, why didn't I think of that moment? So, you know, that that collaboration is is really, really special. And they are a gift, you know, those kind of notes. So I you know, I I'm not gonna question Adele's writing habits at all. I think, you know, she's it's clearly worked for her uh, in big time. So um yeah. Yeah. And actually within the it's interesting you mentioned beta readers, because within the beta readers group, you can sometimes find that one person that you then becomes your go-to. And um, you wrote about that in a recent course that we're just about to launch on yes. the bestseller academy about beta readers. So if you're if you're interested about beta readers and how it works, but also how to how to manage that group and how to how to make get the most out of that group. You know, Mark and I had an incredible experience with our 100 plus beta readers for Back to Reality when we were writing that in season one. And so we developed a kind of a course around that on the Academy. So if you're interested in that, do check out the Academy uh, at academy.bestsellerexperiment.com because it, it kind of goes into a lot of detail and it's huge. I mean, we, it's coming up almost almost every interview, isn't it? We, we hear of, especially within the indie world, about the importance of beta reading, but it's never been something that's been hugely developed as a a how-to, a skill into how to manage your actual beta reading team, how to find beta readers, which one of the other things about the Academy I'm loving right now is the fact that a lot of the Academates are beta reading for each other. Yes. And so they've got this, you've got sympathetic beta readers, people that are going through the same journey as you are, which makes a huge difference, I well, think, this because is, there's a lot of empathy there. This is what we hoped for the Academy more than anything, I think, was that a community would grow completely organically out of the people in there and they'd start helping each other out. And I think we've, you know, there are some people there are going to be friends for life. You know, the people there are going to be contemporaries in, in their writing careers. So it's it's brilliant seeing that blossom. Absolutely. Excellent stuff. So Mr. Stay, on social media, we have a few wins this week, I believe. Yeah, well, uh, it's wonderful stuff. Um, Lorna Cook, who uh, has been on the podcast before and was a winner of the RNA Award last year, her third book, The Girl from the Island, is out now. Gorgeous cover. Absolutely gorgeous cover. Um, so yeah, out in time for the summer. So big congrats to, to Lorna on the publication of The Girl from the Island. Another 
summer smash, I think, uh, third year on the row, I think. So brilliant, brilliant. And, and Lorna's a member of the, the bestseller experiment group on, on Facebook. So, you know, those are the kind of authors you could be hanging out with if you, if you come and join us on Patreon. Uh, also happening on Patreon, and this has been absolutely fascinating. This is um, a Gavin Ralph who writes as GB Ralph, and he's got uh, a, a gay rom-com novella series that's, uh, he's got duck and dive, slip and slide over and out. And he's been retweaking his covers. You know, we were talking about, you know, new titles and what have you, but he's been working on his covers and he was using the group to sort of beta test it. And he would put variants up there and get feedback from them and make changes accordingly. So he's just uh, relaunched his uh, series. And it's, it's absolutely fascinating because I thought I'd go and have a look at his his website. And his website is brilliant. It's gbralph.com. And when you click on the books, uh, you look down, each, each book has its own separate page. But he says, you know, uh, here are the, you know, here's what you'll find inside. And he's got these little emojis of what you'll find inside his book. And I think this is brilliant. So what you'll find inside his first book, Duck and Dive, banter, gaze, romance, comedy, quiche, quiche, quiche. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> coming out, nosy neighbours, funny old people, pleasant surprises, sculpted arms, shameless innuendo, and bingo. I mean... <laughs> Who doesn't want to read that? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think it's I, I, go to go to gbralph.com, look at one of his books, and he's got these wonderful sort of emojis there. I think it's such a clever idea. It just Brilliant. sums everything up for you. In a lo- so, you know, what are your emojis, listeners? What emojis would you be using to describe uh, your book? So let's let's start a conversation about that. So congrats on that, uh, GB Ralph. Brilliant stuff. Um, and just on the 200 words a day thing, more and more people are joining in. Tom Cooney, uh, who is at Tom Cooney, Cooney writes on Twitter, back in the saddle with 200 words a day for four days. I know, but it's a start, but with the lowest tally of 323 and a total of over 2,000 happy days. So congratulations, Tom. Fantastic. Tom's one of those people who took that. We've, we're saying to people on Twitter, just try it for five days uh, and, and you, it'll get you back into the habit. And Tom, Tom's done that as well. Brilliant stuff. Excellent. Uh, and have you, have you had a look at Back to Reality on Amazon recently? I've not been on for at least two or three hours, I think. But no, I haven't. I know I haven't. I haven't been on for a couple of weeks, actually. Funnily enough, or even a month. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, 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 I haven't actually checked the reviews. There's a wonderful review on Amazon uh, UK uh, from Mand M A N D. Five stars. Love, loved it. Mysterious and daft. <laughs> Left me wanting more. <laughs> Sums us up. Uh, Mand Man says everything I love in a book: music, fun, jeopardy, and a cow. Uh, but here's the challenge for you, Mr. D. Man says, what I would have loved would be to interact a little and be able to hear Ellie's song as a special Kindle feature. This, so- is, this has come up before, hasn't it? I think this is the second or third request, Ellie's song. And we do have somewhere in the book, we have some of the lyrics already written. Ah, yes, but we have Kindle- just... We have described it as the greatest song ever written. So uh, good <laughs> luck. Like, no <laughs> bloody pressure, right? <laughs> I do like that idea, though. How how fantastic. I mean, in the world of, uh, if you've been following the, the tech news, the tech world, the world of NFTs, there's the buzzword out there right now. Mm. But, you know, the book world is going to be changing, folks. Um, I'm looking into it. It's going to be changing. And I think, it, you know, these will a book in the future be just a book? You know, or will it well, be more of a, a box I mean, set of different things? They have they have tried them. I mean, I remember Orion. We did uh, enhanced eBooks with sort of DVD extras in mm. there and video interviews, and no one was interested. No one bought them. Amazon have even had a go. They brought out special editions of you know classics like Alice in Wonderland, where you can interact and move things around the screen. I don't think they've been a success, but. Um, I, sometimes people just want a book, just want a book, you know. Uh, but you never know. I think the song, well, you know, when the well, it, when the it, Netflix it, TV show gets made, someone will have to. I write think it that's in, you yeah. see that's that's <laughs> when we'll do it, right? When 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 we, we've got an interview coming up, which will fascinate everyone about uh, somebody oh, that man. Uh, <laughs> you just. All we'll say is that listen out the next couple of weeks. We have got the most bonkers interview, and it's going to inspire the the pants off you. But the the idea is is that you know what we should be setting mark is is we should be putting out there this idea that you know back to reality next Netflix show, and when that happens, 
I will write the theme song. There you go. So we have to what kind of... Because the we, we have to work out, you see, here's the thing. We have to work out who's going to play Ellie and who's going to play Joe because as a younger Joe, because that's the person that will be singing it. Yeah, well, on, I'm still, I'm still holding out for either Adele or Beyonce. So, I um, think so. Lady Gaga, yeah. maybe. Well, may, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Lady Gaga, yeah. So yeah, if, yeah. if you're listening, you know, get in contact. I think maybe mm. uh, maybe they could take it to the studio. Fantastic stuff. Anyway, Mark, it's been absolutely funny, <laughs> fabulously funny today. I'm going to have to listen back to that and just see if we could actually hear what we were saying during that five minutes of chaos. But um, <laughs> thank you so much for all the fun and laughs this week. Absolutely brilliant. It's uh, definitely, definitely great medicine. And Thank you to everyone listening to this show. We hope you've been inspired. We hope you've had a good laugh. You know, if, if we just, all you've got from today is just laughed with us, then we're happy people. Um, so please, please spread the word about the, the podcast. Tell your writing friends. Get get them kind of get them hooked in from episode one and, and give them inspiration as well to write their book. And um, have a fantastic week, Mister Stay. Look forward to the the next episode. Absolutely. Folks, if you want to get in touch, uh, you can drop us a line via email at bestsellerexperiment.com. There's a contact tab there. Facebook, we're Bestseller Experiment. Twitter and Instagram, we are at Bestseller XP. And if you enjoyed this episode, give us a rating, give us a thumbs up, whatever it takes. Spread the word. Tell your friends. Go to that writer's group and say, hey, this lot, ignore the first 20 minutes about video stores. And then there's some real (laughs) gold in there. So, um, yeah, yeah. Spread the word. And don't forget to join us on the 200 Word Challenge, 200words.com. Get your writing habit back in the saddle. So it's a goodbye from Mark 1. And a goodbye from Mark 2. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye. Goodbye.